Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, focusing on leveraging CBCT to diagnose and plan endodontic cases. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. If at any point during the webinar you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover them at the end. To ensure a smooth viewing experience, please make sure that your volume is up and any large applications on your computer or mobile device are closed. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Tadros, an endodontist who provides his patients with pain relief using the most advanced and state-of-the-art dental technology. Dr. Tadros, thanks for being with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Good evening and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tadros and uh, I'm an endodontist in Hudson, New Hampshire. Uh, Happy to be uh, here this evening with everybody. And uh, we're gonna be discussing a, uh, a subject uh, that is like related to, an, to endodontics, which is the use of CBT, uh, CBCT in diagnosing and treatment planning of endodontic cases. Um, uh, I'm gonna now start going through the outline of our presentation tonight. Uh, first, we're gonna just go on a brief background about myself and uh, about my uh, endodontics and what we do in our office. Uh, we're gonna discuss reasons why CBCT is important in endodontics. Uh, we're gonna be discussing uh, different types of uh, field of views um, and, and also gonna be talking about radiation dose considerations. We're gonna be talking about uses of CBCT in endodontics and some limitation of CBCT uh, patient selection criteria, uh, and then in the end, we'll be going through a Q&A, um, discussing like all, um, like seeing like your, your questions, anything I can answer at the end of the presentation. Um, in the beginning, I just wanna talk briefly about myself. Uh, like I said, I'm an endodontist. I work in Hudson and near Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, I've been working uh, in the area uh, for about a year. Before that, I used to work in Boston. Um, I did my DDS degree at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, I did, I, and I got my certificate of endodontics uh, from Boston University. Uh, I'm currently uh, an officer in, uh, in the Army Reserve, uh, dental officer. Uh, and also um, I have become a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics in 2019. Um, this is my office. Uh, we are located in Hudson, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, I've been practicing in this office for about a year. That was my first um, office uh, to purchase back a year ago. Um, so we're gonna talk about CBCT. First thing I did when I uh, purchased my practice was to purchase a CBCT. Um, there are many different types in the market and uh, there is no really bad or good ones. There is usually one that works for you, works for what you need, and ones that then yeah, you don't really need. They come in different shapes and sizes and features. Uh, and we're gonna be discussing today, we're gonna be focusing on its use for endodontics and what we uh, do uh, or like how we use it in treatment planning and diagnosing our uh, endodontic cases. Um, so we all know that x-rays are important. We all take x-rays for our patients. Uh, we all um, use them on a regular basis and they're very essential. We can't really diagnose anything without uh, x-rays. Um, there are different limitations uh, of x-rays. Uh, we know that when we take bite wings or PAs, panos, all of these x-rays, they have their uh, limitations um, from uh, anatomical variation, uh, superimposition. Uh, you have to also look at the part that, you know, um, periapical radiographs has its limitation because of looking into a two-dimensional view uh, is de definitely different than looking into a three-dimensional view, meaning that you're looking into one side of the story here. You're not really looking at the whole angle, uh, the whole scoop of, of everything. Um, and that's why I consider CBCD as a very important tool in diagnosing and treating our cases in endodontics. Um, there's also um, 
distortion, uh, certain type of, of distortion when we take x-rays uh, from pano uh, or even um, PA angles, all this stuff, sometimes it could hide or misinterpret uh, things that we see in radiographs. Uh, these problems can definitely be overcome if you use a small or a limited vision volume uh, cone beam uh, CBCT. Uh, it will produce to you an accurate 3D image of the teeth and surrounding structure depending on what you're looking for, uh, whether it's bone, whether it's tissue, whether it's uh, um, teeth. Uh, it definitely gives you like a full view of what you are planning uh, when you come to treat your patients. Um, I'm going to be talking now about different field of view, <clears throat> or as we call it, FOV. Um, this is basically a uh, it, it's basically described the scan volume. And it's, it's definitely dependent on many uh, aspects. First is the uh, size and the shape of the, of the uh, detector. It also uh, comes from like, you know, also the beam projection, the geometry, uh, and the ability to collimate the beam. Um, collimation of the primary X-ray beam limits the, the radiation that you use during the x-ray when you are exposing the area of interest. Um, the field itself, uh, the, again, they come in different sizes uh, and different fields. Uh, so it has limitation because like, like, you know, sometimes you don't wanna see so much or like you wanna see one, one, some, one thing in particular. And this can be selected for each patient, again, based on disease presentation and the, the region you're trying to interpret or see in your scan. In general, uh, so I can, you know, save you guys from all the technical information. In general, the smaller the scan, the smaller the view, the higher the resolution, the lower effective radiation dose. So if you want something in particular or a small structure, you want to have a smaller field of, view, field of view, smaller scan volume, and definitely you're going to have a higher resolution and lower radiations uh, compared to anything, like to a bigger field. But again, that's what will take me to why we use it or how we use it in endodontics. For endo, uh, definitely limited or focus uh, FOV of CVCT is definitely preferred uh, over large volume. Again, for endo, you are focusing on one, two T's. Uh, you are looking for some anatomical areas around one particular area. You don't really need to have a big uh, field for that. And I'll be discussing this in detail as once we move forward toward that. Uh, when you increase the resolution, you'll be able to have a better uh, diagnostic accuracy, uh, which will help you in, in diagnosing endodontic uh, uh, pathology. Um, you, want, you want to be able to see small, small stuff. Like again, we're talking about canals, we're talking about accessory canals, we could be missing canal. Uh, that's why you want to have the highest possible resolution. Uh, also, you don't want to ex expose the patient to unnecessary radiation. Any x-rays we take, uh, whether it's uh, CBCT or even radiograph, you have to also keep in mind that you don't want to expose your patient to unnecessary radiation. You only want to use what is needed. And that's why for endodontics, when we use a small field of vision, uh, we are able to use a small amount of those of radiation and also being able to find what we're looking for uh, to help us treating, diagnosing, and treatment planning our patients. Um, you don't want something to take too long. Uh, it it saves you the time. If you're gonna keep taking x-rays, different angles, uh, bite wing, PAs, all this stuff, one scan, one small uh, scan, and you will be able to find what you want. Uh, and also smaller area of responsibility. For endodontics, when you take a CBCT, you're, you're responsible on anything you see. Even if you take a PA, anything you see, uh, not only for one tooth, any teeth you see in the x-ray, you're responsible to detect any sort of pathology, any concern, and you have to rely this to, any, to, to your patients. Having a bigger scan, having a full head, head scan, you are responsible for larger uh, area, and you have to provide full interpretation uh, to anything you see because you're responsible. If you miss anything, it's a, it's a liability on you. So um, that's why in endodontics, we focus on a particular anatomical area of interest 
which is the T's or the twos we are treating. Radiation consideration. Uh, there is some um, scientific information here. I'll try to make it as simple as possible, but basically we measure our ex radiation exposure uh, through a unit called sieverts or SV. Uh, it's, a large, it's a large unit. So in maxillofacial imaging, micro sievert is usually from 10 to six micro uh, sieverts. These are typically, that's how we are usually like reported in uh, maxillofacial. Radiation dose to, to specific tissue, again, is measured, adjusted for the amount that, that uh, this tissue in the field of vision uh, can be handling this, uh, uh, this amount of radiation and its sensitivity to this tissue. Uh, there are more information about this radiation, and I'm sure like, uh, uh, in the crowd here, like, there are so many people who have more information about this in detail, but basically tissue, tissue sensitivity is something we use to uh, assess the effective dose and what's needed was too much so we can have the safe uh, amount of radiation that we uh, need when we uh, expose our patient to them. Uh, just a schedule I throw here, uh, which is basically, this is a, this published uh, effective dose. As you can see here, uh, we're looking into a peri radiograph, the, the amount of microceiver in there, uh, bite wings, uh, and again, this is F-speed, so it could differ from one to another. Uh, Kodak for anterior, this is the amount of, of like CBCT. CBCT for maxillary posterior, this is how much. And CBCT focus field, again, for mandibular, this is how much sievert you're looking for. Um, and you can see that the amount is not really that big when we are talking about a uh, small field of vision. Um, Typically, the smaller the field of vision for a given system, the lower the radiation dose applied. And that's why in Donix, it's, not, it's, it's safe when we use the CBCT when it's needed uh, to help us treating our patients. And we always explain this information to our patients, telling them that it's not, it's safe because we are using a small field of vision rather than exposing them to too many PAs or bite wings uh, that could not be really helpful in diagnosing some of the cases in lungs. Um, I'm going to be talking now about the uses uh, of CBCT in, in lungs, and then we will be going in each one of them in details. So, uh, use of CBCT, we use it for endo and diagnosis, detection of periapical lesions. Uh, we use them sometimes for preoperative anatomy assessment. We use them for uh, detection of cracked teeth or vertical root fractures. We have a certain usage of it, of course, for surgical and non-surgical treatment planning and endo. Uh, we also use it in cases of inflammatory resorptive defects. And finally, in trauma, in cases of trauma. Uh, and I'll be going through an example of cases in each one of them as we go through the presentation. Um, first, uh, diagnosing of uh, periapical lesions. Um, Endodiagnosis is also definitely uh, depends on patient chief complaint, uh, medical dental history, clinical examination. Uh, CBCT has the ability to detect uh, periapical pathology. There are many studies that actually confirm that when, and compared uh, both um, uh, the, the ability of PAs, periapical radiograph versus CBCT. And you know, uh, they, like many, many clinical studies uh, has found that uh, per epicardial lucency was detected 20% of cases using a radiograph compared to 48% using CBCT. And this is an article uh, to whoever can, you know, like want to go back and uh, look for the articles. I put the information there. Uh, the ability to determine the etiology of pain can be also determined, to, like attributed to many to limitation in both clinical vitality testing, intraoral radiograph. Sometimes our clinical testing alone is not enough for us to detect the sources of problem. And that's why we need further uh, uh, tools like X-rays, CBCTs, uh, to find where this could be happening. Uh, sometimes not just the X-ray by itself or clinical presentation by itself could not just be um, a sole uh, uh, resource to help us uh, detecting those. Um, CBCT imaging detected 17% more 
TS with apical bone loss or apical parenthitis than intraoral radiograph. Uh, definitely, there's a, a significant uh, difference here using a CBCT versus periapical radiograph in trying to detect uh, apical parenthitis uh, cases or uh, periapical uh, lesions. Uh, this is an example here. On the left, you can see a, a periapical radiograph, and on the right, you can see a, a CBCT. You can see how big of a difference you can. Uh, between these two. It's a, it's a big um, big difference when you see like how big the lesion and how obvious the amount of bone loss versus you see some you know artifact here or maybe slight of delucency, you're not really sure. Uh, so definitely using a CBCT in this case was, was very helpful. Um, this is another case um, that was a 14 years old patient presented to us to check on tooth number uh, 13. Um, patient uh, had some sinus tract uh, on the buccal mucosa of the tooth, and uh, general dentist or pediatric dentist actually who referred to us uh, thought that there could be something going on, um, an apical abscess happening with that tooth, so they, they sent her over. Uh, we took a CBCT, and here you go. It's not only number 13 is a problem here, uh, we also have number 12. Uh, big lesion on both. Um, although like on, on the periapical radiograph, we couldn't really see much happening here, almost looked normal. Uh, and the problem is, is obviously in number 13. But when you go here and see number 12, on the scan, definitely was, was a game changer. And in this case, we actually treated both cases, uh, like both these. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about the preoperative anatomy assessment. Uh, when we uh, see patients for endodontic treatment. The success of endodontic treatment depends on the ident identification of all root canal system. Uh, Dr. Herbert Schilder uh, in BU back in the 60s, when he wrote his first article describing uh, endodontics, uh, he mentioned root canal system. He, he did not use root canal or a canal or two. He mentioned root canal system. And in that particular reason is that these are not just straightforward canals. There are a lot or like, you know, hundreds of uh, accessory canals. It's a system. And that's why we use that term in endodontics, root canal system. Uh, and sometimes in order to, to the, achieve treatment, you need to be able to uh, clean most of the system to achieve success. Uh, CBCT showed higher uh, mean value of, of specificity and sensitivity when compared to intraoral uh, radiograph, uh, especially looking for MB2s, sometimes even MB3s. Um, and many articles were, were published about that show the superiority of CBCT in uh, locating and finding uh, those uh, extra canals. Um, this hidden canal system that we cannot see uh, with uh, uh, regular periapical radiographs and definitely it achieve the, the predictability of our treatment and the outcome and success of uh, endodontic treatment. Uh, this is a case, actually, like I saw this case a few days ago. Um, this case uh, received endo treatment done uh, and redone twice. Patient uh, still has some sinus tract, pain, discomfort. Um, when you look at the x-ray from the beginning, like, oh, you know, that's, that looks like a decent x-ray, you know, a decent root canal, tooth number 14. Uh, the, the root has, you know, is clean almost all the way to the end. There, there shouldn't be an issue. I'm not seeing any, an issue with that. But this is, again, the limitation of periapical radiograph. When you, uh, <clears throat> when, you, when we decided to take a CBCT, here's what we saw. First, we saw a big lesion right there. This is after one year, by the way, of the root canal. Uh, and here, this is the MB root, this is buccal root, and palatal root. And here we can see the missing MB2. And, and, and this is in the axial view. In the, in the other view, we see here a complete missed canal. And poor thing, you know, like, like she's been having this issue going back and forth between, you know, uh, her dentist, other specialists not knowing why she is not responding to this treatment. A patient was almost planning on getting extraction. We took a CBCT, 
we uh, redid the root canal and we were able to find those canals and clean them all the way and the patient has been uh, comfortable since then. Uh, so made, a, made a big difference and helped, helped to change the treatment plan from the patient from extraction, sinus, sinus graft and all this to just redoing the root canal and you should get to safer tooth. Uh, moving forward, um, detection of cracked teeth and vertical root fracture. As an endodontist, this is one of the very uh, common thing we see in our practice. I would say like, you know, there was no like one day a week, uh, I don't see a patient uh, who is uh, having a, a cracked tooth uh, condition. Um, unfortunately, two-dimensional two radiographs uh, of limited view and very limited value, I mean, to the diagnosis of either vertical roof fracture or, a horizontal, or even horizontal roof fracture. Um, it's in able, in able to, to see this on the x-ray, uh, the tooth really has to be fractured enough to show that, meaning that the, the radiation has to go through this crack in, in particular angle. Again, it's hit or mess, and you'll be able to see that. Uh, crack teeth represent, again, a, a dilemma for everybody, every clinician and patient, because they're very complicated. They have very big symptoms. They're very unpredictable with prognosis. Uh, we can't really determine. Uh, I, always, I always like, you know, mention that this is a guarded prognosis. It may work, it may not work. We have to do what we have to do uh, and explain everything to patient because there are limitations on what we can do and definitely unpredictable prognosis. Uh, treatment plans for crack teeth, again, depend on many reasons, uh, many aspects of that. Uh, there are the extent of the fracture or the crack, uh, the location of this crack, uh, this, and also the severity of symptoms. Uh, the treatment can be just from getting just a crown or getting a root canal and a crown. Um, marginal, rich, uh, like marginal rich cracks, uh, it's all, almost impossible uh, to be detected by CBCT, uh, but root fracture or cracks are more able to be detected. Uh, over time, mean yellow distal pattern of bone loss may appear, and that's when we start seeing, uh, you know, pocketing, things like that. Um, there was an article that published by, uh, like, in Journal of Endonics in 2009 that basically found that the sensitivity of CBCT uh, was almost 79%, and the specificity of CBCT was uh, almost 92.5% versus PAs. Uh, that was very uh, actually like only 37 percent. Again, we see a very high value, high clinical value having a CBCT in, in those cases. Um, I'm going to be talking more about that when we discuss uh, the limitation of CBCT, but definitely the presence of Geta Persia uh, post, uh, all this definitely uh, reduce the sensitivity and the specificity. Uh, specificity sorry. Uh, this was, of course, attributed to something we call star-shaped uh, artifact. So that when you look at the scan, you see an artifact going everywhere and many lines. So that could mimic fracture line. So definitely uh, looking at these cases uh, it could be very challenging. And the presence of, of uh, uh, cast post and core or post or even get the pressure fillings could be very could actually present a big challenge for us looking at this. Um, this is an example here. Uh, we are looking at tooth uh, number uh, 12. Uh, patient had a root canal on that tooth two years ago. Actually, it was done. And then uh, he went to a, a different clinician who read the root canal again. Um, patient was still having some discomfort. Uh, there was a sinus tract that keeps appearing and disappearing. Um, not, not sure what, what could be going on. Uh, so, and also a non-healing lesion. Uh, it's been like this and it's been getting worse with time and patient wanted to do something about it. We took a scan for that case and we saw a complete bone loss on um, the buccal aspect, uh, completely gone. I explained to the patient that there is a possibility of a crack or fracture in that tooth and uh, that like retreating tooth that already has been treated twice may not be a good option, um, but the patient wanted to save the tooth no matter what, and he wanted to try. So uh, we decided to go with Epico, uh, or 
apical surgery. And once we raised the flap, uh, we saw a very visible clear crack right, right there. Uh, again, we couldn't see this on the CBCT because um, inertia blocked everything. Uh, in some cases, it could be useful, but in some cases, it's not. Um, so that's for that part. And then we can move forward to planning of uh, surgical and non-surgical treatment. Uh, when you have enough data, you will be able to make a better treatment decision. Uh, and definitely having a more predictable outcome. Um, a study that was done uh, showed that CBCT was more accurate imaging modality for diagnosis and dopasosis uh, when compared to PAs only. Uh, accurate diagnosis also uh, was reached in uh, 36 to 40 percent in some cases using PA versus accurate diagnosis in 76.6 percent to 83 percent. So the way that they did like the study is actually very interesting. They brought about maybe 30 board certified endodontists and they give them CBCTs versus PAs and they found that actually the diagnosis was more accurate with CBCTs uh, looking at all the pasosas or, or the variable in those area they had a better diagnosing ability with CBCT versus PAs. Uh, treatment plan may be also influenced by the information gained from CBCT study. Uh, uh, examiners also like, will be able to alter the treatment plan and change. Sometimes you can be going for uh, a retreatment and then if like, you see something in particular, like, oh, maybe I can't do this. This tooth is very close to the sinuses. This, this, this tooth is very close to the inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, things like that. So you have to also put in consideration a lot uh, when you take a CBCT, uh, it, that actually it could change your whole treatment plan uh, you can see a see-through lesion. Uh, maybe you want to alter this treatment or prepare for it. So you won't be having surprises when you're actually doing the procedure and discovering things that, that like, you know, um, it might not be very uh, convenient uh, to see that while you're doing the treatment. Um, this is an example, a case. Uh, this case had a root canal and then uh, an apical surgery done 20 years ago. Patient had sinus tract on both teeth, uh, non-healing sinus tract for the last five years or so. Um, she was told that she can get them retreated. Uh, she was told that, you know, uh, that's not gonna work, have it extracted, and let's uh, do um, implants or bridge, something of that kind. Uh, we took a CBCT and uh, here's what we saw. Like on the left here, uh, that view here, like we, see, we saw the, the extent of the periapical lesion. As you can see, like when you compare it to the first one, it doesn't look that bad here, but you look at this one here and you see like a big lesion right there. Uh, on the view here, uh, you, you can see a large, like almost perforation of the bone. There is no bone left in this area. It's completely exposed. Um, so we decided to go and redo the surgery again. Uh, we did the apical both teeth and uh, we clean up all the area right there. This is a post-op radiograph on the far right. And the uh, patient came the week after, there was no problem. Uh, uh, the sinus tract disappeared and we're looking for the follow-up in six months, see how it goes. But so far the patient has been comfortable and uh, there was no sinus tract uh, that appeared anymore. And uh, again, alteration of treatment plan. She went from possibly losing her tooth, going through a retreatment or getting implants into just doing a simple apical and saving her teeth. Uh, this is another case. Uh, again, this is another. Uh, uh, we're looking here at tooth number uh, four. A uh, patient received uh, root canal treatment um, uh, in, by a clinician uh, a few years ago. Patient was actually having lots of discomfort with that tooth since then. She even mentioned that sometimes she feels sensitivity to the cold on that tooth. Uh, again, if you look at the x ray here, things look perfect. You know, I don't see any problem. Like it's a Nice root canal, uh, almost all the way to the apex. I, I, don't, I don't really see lesion uh, or, or pre-apical radiolucency to be of concern. So patient was referred over to us. We decided to take a scan and here's what we saw. Uh, in the axial view here, you can see there's a missing palatal root, completely missing. Uh, sorry, uh, buccal root, completely missed. 
Um, at here, the complete canal undetected at all. And not only this, see the, see the brief lucency we see right there? I couldn't even see any of that. And here you go. We did the root canal, patient was symptoms-free, and she's happy, kept her tooth, and uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Moving forward, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the inflammatory uh, resorptive defect and uh, how CBCD could help us in endo in diagnosing, treating those cases. Uh, according to the AE, which is the American Institution of Endodontics uh, statement, omission statement about CBCT, it's highly recommended that CBCT can be used to diagnose, localize, differentiate external antenna resorptions, um, and also to determine the appropriate treatment uh, and prognosis. Um, Definitive diagnosis and treatment planning is also like depending on, how, on, on what we see on those uh, CBCTs and the extent of it. Uh, there was a study that found that two-dimensional X-ray offer very limited diagnostic potential when compared to 3D imaging when treating uh, teeth with resorption. Uh, this is the case we did, we did in our office. Um, patient presented, uh, you know, uh, with that tooth. Uh, was number 24, she had, uh, she, was, she was having some discomfort, you know, on and off. She was not really sure what could be going on. Uh, on a regular exam, uh, her general dentist saw this uh, radiolucency that we see right there. He wasn't very sure there was an internal or external, so he sent her over. Um, we examined everything. Actually, the tooth was vital, so we decided to go ahead and uh, take a scan. And uh, we took the scan here, and what we see here on the far left is that um, there's an external root resorption uh, on the lingual uh, coming and getting into like the pulp, and it's causing all the irritation. On the axial view here, you can see it on that level, and you can see it's right on the level above the bone. Uh, and again, there's another view here. Uh, so what we did is first we did the root canal, the, the conventional root canal treatment. And then we went from the lingual and uh, remove the, uh, retract the flap and uh, remove the resorptive defect, place the uh, restore and clean it. And uh, things has been good and patient will, will be able to save her tooth. Um, now I'll be talking about trauma. And uh, trauma has a, a, a very specific uh, uh, approach when we talk about it because it depends also on the age of the patient. Uh, but according to the International Association of Dental Traumatology guidelines, uh, a series of PA is needed, including also an occlusal film, uh, to be able to determine and diagnose and treat the trauma injuries uh, for this. Unfortunately, when, when you think about it, two-dimensional imaging has limitation uh, in, in this diagnosis. Uh, imagine like bringing the patient, take two different angles or three different angles of PAs, taking an, an occlusal uh, radiograph. And this is also, we're talking here about the patient who probably in pain, uh, have, who has a trauma, has like limited ability to open for a while or you know, have like stuff going to their mouth. So if you can imagine all this, including also the, the super, imposition of anatomical structure, distortion, all this possible error that uh, you have to build your um, treatment plan uh, on is really, really like, it could be like deceiving and doesn't really get you to where you want it to be. So CBCT was definitely like, recommended uh, in, in those cases. Even when you diagnose horizontal acute fracture, uh, you can use the two-dimensional X-ray, but also like they found that also fracture line could be a little bit higher or lower than you expect when you take a CBCT. Uh, again, the limitation of two-dimensional X-ray is uh, in identifying again the location, severity of this of the trauma, especially on her on horizontal root fracture, could lead to misdiagnosis and, in the end, unfavorable outcome because you will not treat it the way you're supposed to treat it. Um, CBCT overcome that uh, and definitely provide you. A considerable amount of information about the nature, about the extent of her of the horizontal root fracture, uh, it's highly recommended in those cases to use limited field of vision CBCT. 
uh, because you want to be able to see where you're treating. You want to see a specific area, uh, and you want to be able to see, uh, have like a full idea of what you're dealing with here. Uh, and that's why it's highly recommended to use a limited field of vision. This is a case I'm sharing from my office. Um, patient had a trauma, actually that was like during COVID. Um, so this was a 14 years old uh, female and she had the trauma uh, while she's playing sports. And um, she came to the office and uh, we're looking here at tooth number 10. Tooth number 10 has a horizontal root fracture and we can definitely see the horizontal root fracture here on the radiograph. But when we look at it here in the CVCT, it gives you more information of uh, how much bone is surrounding this crack. Uh, it show you in the, like this location. It definitely give you more information on those views that we see here on the right side in order for you to treat it and see what you're gonna do about that and what to expect. Uh, very limited information is provided by uh, the periapical radiograph versus the CBCT as you can see. Now, all great, CBCT is great. I love CBCTs and I cannot uh, practice without it. I consider it a very, very valuable asset in our practice. There are limitations. Everything has limitation. We can expect that CBCT will give you the answer to everything. This limitation, as I spoke about, um, the significant issue is that, is that the image quality and, di and diagnostic accuracy of CBCT is a scatter and the beam hardening artifact that could be causing, I mean, caused by high density of a genus structure. Like I said, enamel, radiopaque material like post, get the Persia, restoration, all this stuff. Um, this stuff, you know, we can see here an example of that. This is a case right here. There's, there's a post and get under the Persia on the distal root. And you can see, you can't really see anything. You might even think, oh, is this a crack? Or what could that be? It's, hard, it's really difficult to be able to diagnose anything with, was uh, was a large metal post or even the Persia in those cases. So you have to be very careful and uh, not to rely 100% on what you see in the CBCT and know the CBCT, even if it's a very, very valuable and very important tool to have in your practice, there's also limitation to what you can expect and you can build and you cannot build everything on a sole one, so, uh, one tool, which is the CBCT. You have to use different uh, resources as well. Uh, sometimes also like, you know, patient can move, you know, uh, sometimes like, you know, uh, this also could affect the quality of the picture that you can get. Uh, it's very important to uh, make sure that your patient is lined in the correct position. And again, each machine comes with their specification and you can train your staff on that and uh, you will be able to uh, produce a good quality image if, you know, if all this is followed and your staff followed the instruction that, that you give them. Patient selection criteria. Uh, CBCT should not be used routinely from an, like for, for endodiagnosis or for screening purposes uh, because if you have a patient who doesn't have clinical sign or symptoms, you cannot just expose them to CBCT. You have to have a legitimate reason why you want to use CBCT. Uh, so as long as, as you are using them for the right reason, you should be able to uh, 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 achieve the goal of using this technology. Uh, you, you also have to put in consideration uh, that the patient history, clinical examination, it all has to justify the CBCT uh, was used for the benefit of the patient to be able to uh, achieve a proper treatment planning. And also the patient will also understand the potential risk. Um, very important to use this. Um, even like for, like, you know, like there are different doses of adult versus pediatric patients. Uh, you have to use a certain, a different type of uh, uh, radiation dose or volume to be able to produce what you want without exposing your patient for unnecessary uh, radiation. Uh, in summary, um, I just wanted to go through that uh, in the end. Uh, so like I said, several study evaluated the use of CBCT in endodontics. Uh, they found that uh, it does overcome many limitations of pre radiograph. Uh, the increased diagnostic information provided by CBCT should result in more accurate diagnosis, improved decision-making, management of complex endonic problems. 
uh, it's very desirable uh, in addition to also endonous armamentarium. Uh, the effective radiation dose to patient with, uh, when using CBCT is higher uh, than two-dimensional radiograph. And the benefit to the patient must therefore be overweigh any risk for additional radiation exposure. You have to explain this to the patient, especially children. Um, radiation dose uh, should be kept as low as uh, reasonably achievable, or we call it ALARA. Uh, the value of CBCT in end diagnosis uh, and treatment planning should always be determined at an individual basis to assure uh, the benefit. Risk assessment support for the use of CBCT. Always like use benefit versus risk. How much I'm gonna be getting from this CBCT and how much risk I will be exposing your patient. Uh, I always like to tell my uh, referring dentist that um, always anytime you're in doubt, send the patient over, we'll take a CBCT if needed and we will uh, give you, uh, you know, um, our thoughts, our recommendation uh, if you are practicing in an area where like, there is an endonus who has a CBCT, reach out to them uh, for cases like that. Uh, it's always good to have uh, a specialist support uh, when it comes to uh, uh, reading CBCTs. Uh, most dental schools right now and in the programs in the country, they do provide uh, quite a amount of training for the resident uh, reading and interpreting CBCTs. Uh, so I definitely uh, would recommend that you reach out to um, the specialist in your area. Even if you have the machine and you take a scan and you have concern, question, it's always very important to have such a support in the area where you practice. Uh, so they will be able to uh, help you and support you and your patients to achieve better treatment results. Um, and that concludes my uh, webinar. I know that like, we're trying to do it like, in 45 minutes so we can allow some time for question. So I will uh, let Adam take over from now. Uh, if you know any of the questions, then you know, we can try to answer them together. So I will uh, let the mic to my, Adam. Awesome, thank you for that great presentation. That was definitely a lot of information in a short period of time. So if anyone does have questions, please type them into the Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes left, so we will get started. What material did you use to repair the external root absorption? So there are many materials in the market. I don't advocate for anything. They don't pay me basically, <laughs> but well, there are many materials available in the market. There is MTA, uh, which is a very classic uh, material that we use. Um, again, it depends on the resorption. In the external resorption, we use Jury Store because if you have if you are dealing with a situation where you are dealing with a close proximity to the gums or the gingiva or saliva you want to be able to use a material that doesn't wash out so in this particular case i showed i showed we use cb uh, jury store uh, on the outside which is a very close to um, glass ionomer uh, but it does have a, it sets very quickly it doesn't get affected by uh, saliva or blood and it achieves the result of uh, to prevent any micro leakage. Uh, if the resorption is farther apical, we use different material like MTA, bioceramic uh, putty. Uh, there are different materials in the market that achieve a very good result and has a good track history. Uh, and again, uh, it depends if it's external versus internal. We use different material. It depends on the location and the type of the resorption. What CBCT do you have in your practice and how many CBCTs do you have? I only have one CBCT. Uh, you only like, need one CBCT uh, because it's not like a high volume, like it's not like you take CBCT for every single patient, not like uh, PAs or panels. Uh, I decided to use uh, like a small field of vision one, five by five, because again, for endodontics, I use a particular one. There are many brands in the market. Uh, honestly, they all do that. They all do the same thing. Uh, I don't think I should advocate for a particular brand, but they're honestly all the same. You should use uh, or like buy the one that is fit your need in your practice, and also uh, limit like you know like whatever space you have, and also you have to put into consideration the price. So all these aspects have to put into consideration when you make a decision. Uh, definitely, there are big names and they're well known in the market. You can reach out to um, any like local vendor, and I'm sure that they can give you many 
types and many brands and you can pick whichever works for your needs uh, in your practice. All right, I apologize if I mispronounce this. Aladape is being suggested to replace Alara. As low as diagnostically acceptable, being indication oriented and patient specific. What are your thoughts on that statement? Well, each each approach it has to be scientifically based. Uh, Alara has been used for many years and is uh, scientifically uh, supported. Uh, so, as for endodontics, we still use Alara as a, as a standard. Um, Definitely, there are different changes, and it might change in the future. Uh, but definitely, uh, as in, as endodontics, we try to limit the amount of radiation as possible, and that's why we follow Alara. Uh, but it might change in the future. Um, I think that this is a question more for uh, radiologists. They they give you a better answer on that part because it's, it's like their scope of specialty. But for us in endo, we still go with Alara and. Uh, until like, you know, like there is more recommendation and more scientifically based evidence to follow uh, otherwise. Do you use CBCT with surgical guide for your endosurgeries? I use CBCT for every surgery. Uh, like I said, for many reasons, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we get a full picture of everything uh, from an anatomical structure. Like I said, maxillary sinus, inferior of the nerve, mental nerve, um, we also use it to make sure that, uh, to confirm that the lesion is coming from this particular tooth, not from anything else, amount of bone. Uh, so for my surgeries, all my surgery cases, I take CBCT. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions I have. We do still have some time left. So if anyone has any last questions, please let us know. Um, Dr. Tadros, any, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I, uh, I would just say that, uh, again, thanks, thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh, the attention and all the questions. Uh, if you have any question concern, uh, you can always uh, uh, reach out uh, to me. I, uh, we do have a, I do have a, an Instagram account called Hudson Endo NH. Uh, we post all our cases, everything, and we also, inter also interact with many uh, dentists from all over the world. So feel free to reach out to me if any question you have about any, any cases uh, you might be having. Otherwise, uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for, uh, for the time and uh, for the questions. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your presentation today. And of course, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If any of you do have a question that we were unable to answer or that you think of at a later date, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we will make sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Everyone attending today will receive a link to view the recording of the presentation in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thanks everyone for attending once again. Have a great night.